All right, everybody. How are you? Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Freixas. I am Associate Dean of our Fully Employed and Executive MBA programs. And it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to the first ever Latinx event at UCLA. Uh, as you um, might imagine, we're very excited you could all join us. Um, we here are very um, committed uh, at UCLA Anderson to expanding the diversity of our class in particularly because we have such a um, large Latino community here in California and in Southern California in particular, uh, it is uh, something that's very important to us. And so you're gonna get to meet some of our um, uh, faculty uh, as well as uh, have a lecture from one of our professors and uh, meet some of our alumni uh, who have uh, graduated from both the uh, executive MBA and fully employed MBA program. So, um, uh, the, the staff uh, asked me when we were putting this together to tell you a little bit about my background, so I will do that for a, a tiny bit. Um, I came to this country as a, an immigrant, as a refugee actually from Cuba. Um, we had to get out of Dodge pretty quickly because my father had been arrested and was scheduled to be executed and then was released at the last minute and we were on a plane a few days later to Jamaica where um, we then waited for our paperwork to be able to come to the United States. Uh, and then we were on the first plane load of refugees relocated from Miami to the Los Angeles area. Uh, so that's my story. And I went on to law school uh, and uh, have a master's in tax. And I've been a faculty member here at UCLA Anderson now for 30 years uh, teaching law tax and international business. So enough about me. Um, the other day, uh, we had the pleasure, a few of us here, of attending a presentation that was done by um, US Bank and Univision uh, about uh, the Latino community, uh, what uh, the impact of the Latino community is on business, and particularly the banking business. And they were kind enough to share a few slides uh, from that presentation, uh, from a presentation done by Univision. And I'd like to just share a couple of them with you to sort of lay the foundation here for um, our, um, our discussions today uh, to show you about the importance and the impact that the Latinx community has on our economy here in the United States. So this is uh, the, uh, I wanna give credit where credit is due, U.S. Bank Univision, thank you so much to Yandro Valdez, who you'll be hearing from shortly, uh, who uh, shared this with us. And um, so they talked a little bit about just the cultural aspects of uh, of the faces of American Hispanics from what they called the stereotypical uh, to the mainstream, uh, the very famous actors that, uh, and singers and entertainers uh, that some of you who you may know, some of you may not. Rita Hayworth was an Academy Award winning actress. A lot of people don't realize that she was Latina. Uh, and then to um, some of our firsts, our first uh, Hispanic uh, justice on the Supreme Court, our first astronaut, et cetera. And um, so we're very proud of our community. It, it is a community that has obviously made it into the mainstream, uh, as you can see from some of these products that have a definitely Latino influence. Uh, for your information, the Jalapenos Cheetos is the top selling Cheetos um, flavor of all. Uh, and, uh, and you can now start having a cortadito at Starbucks or a Cuban sandwich at Panera, uh, obviously along with the many Hispanic entertainers that you see um, at the Super Bowl or you hear on the radio. Um, oh, excuse me, uh, this, um, uh, excuse me one second. We had a little, um, a little situation here that I need to um, fix, so I apologize. Um, help me out, Roy, what, what am I pressing here? Yeah, uh, it's gonna be in the lower right-hand corner. Ah, go ahead, yeah, the book, got the it. Book. Yeah, okay, got it. Just press the long little button here, guys, sorry about that. This is the fun part about being online. Um, and, uh, you know, most Hispanics, we, we sort of have to bifurcate ourselves from uh, things like our, um, uh, our work lives, our home life, our lives when we visit our, our tias or our abuelas uh, and, um, and, and our families. So this uh, kind of shows you the very, the, the multicultural aspects of the Latino experience here in the United States. Um, Excuse me, one second, I'm sorry. Um, so now I'd like to share with you a little bit about some Hispanic demographic trends 
uh, particularly those that affect business that you might find interesting uh, to, to highlight the impact that Latinos are having on the. So here are some population figures, uh, 62 million Hispanics in the US as of uh, 2020. Apologies, but I uh, have somebody trying to call me here. Um, and uh, uh, 26 million Hispanics ages 25 through 54, which when you look at products and services, that's the target market that most, uh, most companies uh, go after. And our projected population growth is uh, expected to be 53% for the next five years and 75% for that age group of 25 through 54. Uh, notice that projected out to 2060, uh, that we will be 28% of the population compared to the majority white population, which will be 44% at that time, non-Hispanic whites. Uh, in terms of uh, the local communities, if you sort of break it down, you can see obviously California is about 49% Latino right now. Uh, but look at um, some of the areas around the United States, the Dallas, San Antonio and Houston regions, Chicago, New York and Miami are all big population hubs, if you will, of our communities. Um, and this was really interesting. Over the, uh, uh, from 2018 to 28, it is projected that Hispanics will account for 83% of the labor force growth. That number didn't seem real to me. So I actually went and looked up the statistics and there, and this is it. Uh, because of the non-white Hispanic population that, or excuse me, the white, the non-Hispanic white population that will be retiring out of the workforce. And the fact that um, young Latinos make up such a strong percentage of the workforce, this number is actually accurate, if you can believe that. Um, um, affluent Hispanics uh, are going to be increasing at two and a half times the rate of non-Hispanics over the next five years. Uh, the projected increase in the number of households earning 100,000 will be 36%. And then in terms of economic impact, uh, the Hispanic community in the United States contributes 2.3 trillion dollars to the economy. If US Hispanics were our own country, we would be the seventh largest economy uh, in, the, in the world tied with France. And if you look at the growth in across different industries and compare the growth in Hispanic consumer uh, and spending to non-Hispanics, uh, you can see each of those boxes, uh, tremendous growth. Look at the cars, for example, 42% and uh, telecom and technology. Latinos, uh, there's a lot of statistics that Latinos use technology and mobile technology a lot more than the mainstream population. Um, so, and something that just came out for the first time ever, Latinos are the largest group of Californians admitted to the University of California. Here's a link to a Los Angeles Times story that you can um, uh, take a look at. So in any event, as you can see, uh, we are having a tremendous impact uh, on, the, on the country, a tremendous impact on the economy, uh, and uh, a growing share in both the UC system and also UCLA and UCLA Anderson in particular. Uh, this year, we had our largest ever percentage of Latinos in our fully employed MBA program, for example, and uh, we're very excited about that. Well, that's it. Those are my introductory comments. Again, bienvenidos a todos. And what I'd like to do now is turn things over to our senior associate, Dean Miguel Unsueta. Uh, dean Unsueta is the senior associate dean of all of our MBA programs, including our full-time program. Uh, he is the academic dean that manages all of the curriculum and uh, programmatic things and works extensively with our faculty. And he is also one of our top research faculties in the management management and organizations area where his research focuses on diversity. Uh, he teaches negotiations in both our executive and our fully employed MBA program. So hopefully you'll have a chance to, to have him as your professor. And we thought it would be a, a very interesting thing to do today to have uh, Dean Unsueta do a, a lecture presentation sharing some of his research in the area of diversity so that um, uh, you can see the kinds of things that you will be exposed to when you come to Anderson from some of our top research faculty that teach in our core and elective classes. So Dean Unsueta, I will turn things over to you. And I don't know if you have slides you wanna share or... 
No, Dean Hunsweta is uh, just finishing up a phone call right now. Ah, now. okay. <laughs> so. Well, that's okay. Let's see if our panel is on. Well, you know, um, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask off the bat, um, we'd be happy to answer a few questions. Uh, or if not, we can proceed to our panel, whichever one you want to do, Christina. All right, let me just see that our panelists are on. I see Liz, I see Yandro, I see Otto. All right, I see Kaylee, I'm on. Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, our then. panel is ready. All right, per perfect. So, well, well then let, let me there. advance then uh, and, uh, and introduce our, our panel I don't, and turn it over to, let me introduce the two. Uh, the two members of our admissions team who are here. We have Roy Quinto, who is with our fully employed MBA program, uh, and Cristina Marentes, who is with our executive MBA program. And I will turn things over to Cristina so that she can introduce our panelists, and then we'll hear from Dino Sueta afterwards. Thank you, Cristina. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so nice and so special to, to have you here today at this event. Um, we would like to, to shed a little light on, on who our students are. And um, so I'd like to actually introduce Caitlin up first. Caitlin is going to give us a little bit about, tell us a little bit about her story. And then from there, we're going to go on to Otto, Liz, and Yandro, and then we'll pick up with a, a panel and some Q&A after that. So Caitlin, if you're ready. Should I advance the slide? Yes, please. All right, Caitlin. Thanks, Christina. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's really nice to be here and to see you guys. Um, I'm the product of someone who knew how to work the system. I grew up in Houston, Texas, in a middle class neighborhood, which was zoned to low rated public schools. Um, schools notorious for gang violence and high dropout rates. But I didn't go to those schools. I went to some of the best schools in the city because my dad, who was a school teacher at the time, um, knew I could take a test at four years old and if successful, qualify for highly coveted magnet schools. So I want you to think about that for a second. At four years of age, my dad was able to put me on a path to success. Each of my schools, elementary, middle, and high school were the best public schools in my district. And because I went to these public, these coveted public schools, I had the support and guidance to go to the University of Texas and have experiences that would one day encourage me to strive higher and pursue an MBA. I share this about myself because I know that there are many young people in our community that don't have someone in their lives who know how to work the system someone who can help them get on that road to success. I look at my cousins or even my mother who had just as much potential as the kids in their nicer neighborhood, but because they didn't know how to apply for financial aid or they didn't know they could take a test to qualify for a better school, they weren't able to meet their fullest potential. So as I pursue my MBA and a general management path, I keep this truth in mind. And I feel very fortunate to have the chance to one day represent Hispanics in a leadership role. But I also feel a great responsibility um, to help our young Latinx generation learn how to work their education system. So all of these young people can have a more equal shot at fulfilling their dreams. Um, so I'm in my second year at Anderson and I couldn't have picked a better school to support me in this endeavor. Um, one of Anderson's pillars is share success. And every person that I've had a meaningful interaction with truly embodies this value and tries to um, help others reach their success, their potential. Um, in my experience, the Anderson students really see the value and like myself, probably feel the duty as a future leader to make others um, be as successful as they can. So with that, if you are considering applying, I think that you can expect that type of, um, that type of value at this school. And then with that, I'll hand it over to Otto. Uh, 
Uh, Otto, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Otto Gudiel. Uh, I'm part of the FEMBA program, graduated in 2019. So my class made it just in time to beat COVID. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and my journey to and through Anderson. If we could advance one slide. So just about myself, uh, my parents are Guatemalan. They came here in the 70s, um, not unrelated to the Civil War there. Most of my childhood, my dad was a janitor. My mom worked in accounts payable for a bank and then later as a nanny. I have four siblings. Uh, we all went to public school in Hayward, California, if anyone's familiar with the Bay Area. I went to community college and then transferred to the University of Miami, which was uh, a very important part of my education, the culture shock going to Miami. Um, I thought I knew uh, just this, I had a sense of community and identity, and it was very good to see how it differed uh, regionally in the United States. So that was a great experience. I majored in mechanical engineering. Uh, I was a first generation college graduate, began my career with UPS, and actually I'm still in the logistics industry now. Um, when I finished my undergrad, uh, I think I entered this about 10 year period of, of thinking, well, now what? I think it was very uh, helpful when people, when you're in high school saying, well, you know, get a college degree, that's how you're gonna make it. And, I, and they were right. But after that, I felt is, is, you know, is this it? What should I do now? And then I have notes going back all the way to 2008 saying, I need to take the GMAT. Um, if you can advance one slide. Certainly. So then when it came to applying, I actually applied to both USC and UCLA twice. I got into UCLA, I'm sorry, USC twice and UCLA on the second time. When making the decision about where to go, um, a lot of call it like uh, advice blogs and books tell you, you know, fit is maybe the most important um, aspect of, of your decision. I think I might have fit in better at USC, uh, but I want to be honest here, I, I went with a ranking, which is why I chose Anderson. Um, I don't regret it um, because what I learned at Anderson far exceeded even what I thought I was going to learn getting an MBA. Um, part of my uh, experience at Anderson, I was in the flex schedule section. So I, we would have three weeks remote learning and then every third weekend we'd be, we'd spend all weekend on campus. Even though I was local, I liked that format. I learned better with that format. And I met a lot of classmates that were from all over the US and came in on our weekends, uh, our class weekends. I was part of Alma, Laba, and Soma. Uh, in different ways, I, I related to Anderson. I traveled to South Africa, Chile, and Colombia. Um, some big milestones during my time here. I had I changed jobs year one because I didn't want to travel as much. Uh, I became a father in both year two and year three, which was uh, unexpected and pretty you know, a big a big shock. I would say both times. And right now, I'm a logistics manager with Houston Logistics here in Carson. Um, and yeah, it's been, it was, it was quite an experience and I'm very grateful to Anderson. And then I have one more slide just to further emphasize how lucky I feel that we made it just before COVID. Thank you. All right, Christina. I think there was a question. Um, Let's see here. What, oh, Soma, yes. Lava and Soma. Uh, SOMA is Strategy and Operations, LABA, Latin American Business Association, and ALMA, was it Latino Management Association? I think its name is changing now. I believe ALMA may have already changed. Yeah, it's, I, I, oh boy, do we have any ALMA members here? It's either Ander, uh, Anderson Latinx Management Association. Yep, I think Latin, they, they might have kept the, the acronym then. It's still yeah, they, they kept the acronym, they just changed it from Latino to Latinx. Okay. <laughs> Rebranding. It's good. <laughs> and good job, Otto, on the acronyms. <laughs> oh, Be more inc in inclusive. And people might wonder why we have two Latino organizations on campus. And um, the LABA is predominantly, although all the Latino, a lot of the Latinos uh, at Anderson joined, but um, it's a lot of the students from Mexico and Latin America, including um, Brazil, uh, that are international students that come here to study for the full-time MBA. Uh, but they put on some amazing conferences and event, and it's a terrific group. Um, and Alma um, is more focused on the Latino or Latinx community in the United States. Uh, but there's a lot of 
cross pollination there, if you will. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, now, next up, Liz Cercado. Hi. All right. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I, this has been something that I have been looking forward to for several weeks now. Um, so my name is Liz Cercado. Uh, I will echo Otto's commentary on just slipping in uh, pre-pandemic on graduation. And I am just so excited to see so many people that are thinking of making the jump for either a FEMBA or an EMBA on this call, I can guarantee you won't regret the jump, um, albeit much different than what it looked like um, when I went. Um, but I was in the EMBA monthly section. Uh, it was the first time we offered a monthly uh, section within the EMBA program. Um, and so uh, that was quite the experience. And just a little bit of background about me. Uh, so I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Um, my mom is from Juarez, Chihuahua, and my dad is from Leon, Guanajuato. And I'm the youngest of three. Both of my uh, siblings and I were born in El Paso, Texas. Grew up there. I went to school there. Um, I also studied mechanical engineering. Uh, I went to the University of Texas at El Paso. So it's the home of the miners. But Kate, I, I was about to type hook and horn. So <laughs> uh, uh, good job on the UT representation. And um, yeah, and then after uh, graduating with my degree in mechanical engineering, I decided to, yeah, hook them. And then if we want to do minors, picks up, it's all, all represented here. Um, yeah, after I graduated in mechanical engineering, I decided to move up to the Seattle area to pursue uh, an opportunity at Boeing. And that's okay. Uh, you can move forward, Gonzalo. Thank right. you. Um, so yeah, and I've been at Boeing now for over 12 years. Uh, started in engineering on the 787, uh, been most of the time in the Boeing commercial airplane side of the house, and then uh, transitioned into management about year seven, and then currently supporting the 777 program. So I had a, a little bit of a unique experience. I some would say weird. <laughs> um, I was a person that was flying back and forth uh, once a month. So I, I was out of Seattle and I would fly once a month to school uh, to do the monthly program. And then I would also just find myself hopping down to take advantage of a few opportunities. So the picture that you have here, when I saw that Gonzalo was on the call and that Yandra was on the call, this is the picture that came to mind. So this is the picture of us in Colombia on one of our global immersions. So I chose to pursue a global management concentration as part of the EMBA program. And uh, we had a chance to go to both Bogota and Medellin Medellin, excuse me, it was awesome. Uh, this is one of the pictures that we took at one of the, the coffee farms that we had a chance to, to learn about. And so you can see uh, uh, Gonzalo in the center and then Neandro is next to the person in the sunglasses on the left-hand side. Um, but this was our, our Hispanic representation picture, our Latinx uh, uh, representation picture. And we had Colombia. We just, it was just so awesome to share that with with our cohort and, and also across just the Anderson family um, because the global immersions are something that are just open to all programs. So we have full-time, we have FEMBA, we have EMBA, and also the global and US program, which is just an awesome experience to get to meet folks from all across the school. And we um, have a representation from all, from full-time FEMBA and EMBA in this picture of our Latinx students. So it was terrific. Yeah. So this is the picture that came to mind on just inspiring and like <laughs> ah, things that make my heart happy and, and the closing picture on just graduation, right? So after some ugly cry nights and some times that you really question why you're doing it, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, you find your way and you, and you get to get to graduation. So the picture on the left um, is in one of our uh, major halls. Um, I stood next to the Mexican picture just uh, for my parents, the center pictures of my family. Um, my mom, my siblings, um, and also my nephew graduated the same day. So we both uh, had our cap and gown. And then the far right picture is of my uh, kind of our, our thesis project, if you will, um, for our EMBA program with my, my cohort here. So really happy to be here. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. All right, Yandro, you're up next. Oops, You're muted, Yandra. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. You can hear me? Yes. Perfect, yes. Okay, great, great. Well, well, first, uh, Liz, it's so great to, to see you. And, and like you were talking about things that make your heart happy. Well, uh, I'm, I'm so glad to see us doing together. When you see some of my pictures, I think we're on the same wavelength. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so again, I'm Yandro Valdez. I completed the executive MBA program uh, in class of 2019. 
And again, first, I want to thank, you know, Christina, Gonzalo, and, and the rest of the team. Um, it's, it's just a pleasure to be invited to uh, the UCLA uh, Anderson Latinx event. Um, so since this is a focus on Latinx, um, I wanted to start by telling you a, a story about my background and Latin roots. Um, so my, my grandparents, uh, from both my, my father and my mother's side, are all from Spain, and they moved to, uh, to Cuba, um, which is, again, very similar to, to Gonzalo here. Um, so what's interesting is they, they moved to Cuba around the 50s and 60s, and uh, then all my family was, the rest of the family was born there, my parents, their siblings, and I was born in, in Cuba, came to the United States when I was five years old. Uh, I started school almost right away and uh, had an excellent ESL teacher, uh, although sometimes, you know, my, my Spanglish comes out, uh, you know, now and again. So I have to tell people, uh, you know, my English is not very good looking, uh, which is something Celia Cruz said. So it's not, you know, something I came up with. But usually that, that makes me uh, feel a little bit better when I stumble on my Spanglish words. Um, so my journey at UCLA uh, really started when I was uh, an undergrad. And uh, my friend John Katz had told me about um, his dream school uh, for his MBA was UCLA. And honestly, I didn't really know much about, about the program because, you know, frankly, being an immigrant to the United States, um, had to figure out the, the school system kind of on our own because my, my family didn't uh, speak English uh, either. So they weren't as involved, not because they didn't care. They just had no idea how to manage the, uh, the school system. Um, so fortunate enough, I, I actually started working at a, at a bank when I was 18 um, through my undergrad as well. And uh, right after undergrad, I had the opportunity to move to California. The bank was expanding. And, uh, and then that UCLA vision uh, kind of came to fruition again. So long story short, um, I've been wanting to, to get my MBA since uh, my, my mid-20s. And finally, that push to apply uh, came about in 2016. And I was looking at USC and UCLA as well. And after uh, sitting at both programs and uh, meeting some of the cohort, um, UCLA definitely just called to me and uh, was, was the right decision. Um, so are we at the pictures yet? Yeah. Are you the next one? All right. So the first one here um, uh, on the left, I mean, this is really a lot of the global immersion. And as uh, Liz, you can see, we were on the same wavelength because I had the same picture right there as well. And uh, I wanted to bring this up because the experience, obviously, from an academic uh, perspective is going to be rigorous and, and, uh, and, and rewarding at the same time. But uh, I, the common denominator here, if, you, if you're going to go to UCLA, is uh, take classes with Gonzalo. I mean, that's really the takeaway here. Uh, as you can see, um, some of the international trips uh, were just more memorable than, than I can describe. And uh, you will eat like a king and uh, like royalty, rather. And uh, also, that's something to keep in mind, because if you do the executive MBA program, you're going to be eating a lot. So I'm still working off my, uh, my MBA weight here. Um, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, next one. Sure. Thanks, Hang on a second. Sure. And then finally, the last slides here, uh, or the last pictures, um, I wanted to add these two. On the left, um, I, I took a picture next to the Cuban flag, because when I first met Gonzalo, he had told me that there was uh, uh, no Cuban Americans that uh, went to UCLA, Anderson, that graduated, that were, were actually were born, born in Cuba. Cuba. Yeah. That were born in Cuba. There were, there were some uh, 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 Cuban Americans, but none of them were born in Cuba, and that was a requirement at Corn Hall to have a, a flag posted there. So after I graduated, they put a, a Cuban flag there, and I thought that was uh, fun to take a picture next to. And uh, and then finally, uh, to wrap it up, you know, the, the family. So that's uh, uh, my mom, grandmother, aunt, and some of the the the, uh, the matriarchs of the of the family um, was uh, you know again it was their first time uh, in in Los Angeles since they came to the United States. So it was great to be able to experience. Uh, that with them and and on on this beautiful campus. So, so that's uh, my journey. In a nutshell. Thank you, Yandro. Nice to see you. All right. Actually, we are going to start with uh, the the panel discussions. So if we can pin Yandro, Otto, Caitlin, and Liz. That would be great. All right. All right, so I have a few. Oh, and actually, can we go to the next slide, please? Certainly. Hang on one second. Ah, there we are. There we are. All right, so I have a few questions for you before we go and um, go ahead with the Q&A from the prospective applicants. But 
my first question for you is, what are the relationships that supported you through your MBA journey? For example, friends or family. And, and so, so to that, who are the unsung heroes that deserve acknowledgement in your journey? And we can start off in. with Caitlin. Sure. Um, I would say my husband and my best friend. So my husband, because um, he's been really understanding when kind of like our weekly schedule turned upside down. We used to um, spend evenings together and now all of a sudden I'm in class two nights a week and probably have group calls um, an additional two nights a week. So he's been super supportive. And um, I think that's really important too, if you do do this program and you have a significant other to make sure they're, they have your back and they don't make you feel like you're neglecting their relation, your relationship. And then my best friend, because, you know, in this MBA, you're going to try things that you've never done before. Um, hopefully you're doing that. And um, sometimes at least for me, I feel inadequate or like, I don't have the skills to be able to do that. Um, and you just kind of like get down on yourself, but my best friend is really good at kind of pumping me back up and seeing the skills that maybe I can't see at that moment. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, we'll go ahead with Yandro. All right, can you hear me? Christina, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry, I got off. Well, so, so my very similar um, to what's been said, uh, I think uh, my, my best friend, uh, one of my best friends, Adam, uh, he, I think, was uh, also the, the catalyst of, of why I, I finally pulled the trigger to do my MBA. Um, we were going to try to do it at the same time, but uh, just with work, things weren't aligning. But uh, he had just completed his program, and, and he was uh, the major motivating factor um, and then uh, I have a, an amazing golden doodle who's uh, phenomenal. And I think uh, on my st stressful days, he's uh, been supportive all the way. So, um, and, and then the last one is um, my, my boss and leadership at the bank uh, that I was with at the time. They were very um, supportive. And obviously uh, on, on weekends after I'd come back, I was doing the, the biweekly program. I'd um, uh, implement a lot of what we've been learning and, and uh, some frameworks uh, to, to my job almost immediately. So they really appreciated that. All right, Liz? Uh, you know, you said unsung heroes, Christina, and I actually try to do it. I was trying to be thankful to people as I was going through it. Because like I mentioned earlier, there was so many nights that it's just, you kind of question, what, why am I doing this? Um, so you saw my family in the picture, they were big motivators, you know, the folks that would see you working late nights, not posting the pictures on social media on, on, you know, the fun immersions we just showed you the, the hard nights, uh, family was there, um, friends as well. And I think on the friend side, it was just the understanding that, you know, I was making a commitment to do my executive MBA program while being thousands of miles away from the school and then still being invited, you know, for coffee or you're being invited, you know, to dinner or just a check-in, right? Like, how are you? That went a really long way. And I'll say just the sprinkles of like coworkers, um, you know, they knew the demands and, 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 and I think the thing I always appreciate was just, they, they understood and they're like, keep going. Like we really admire you. And it was just those little moments of, of encouragement. It's like, you know, after having a, a class weekend or after, you know, finishing an exam, just those little moments I think are what helped uh, just move along. And I mean, yeah, there was one example of the awesome people you get to meet um, the cohort and the staff um, are also the, the little motivators that keep you going day by day and um, the ones that, you know, you can remiss on via text or WhatsApp or whatever you need, you kind of make it through, so. Thank you, Liz. Christina, can I add real quickly on the Unsung Heroes? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, just real fast, because I, I, I didn't hear you ask that, um, but um, something that just has to be said is um, the admin team, right? So yourself and uh, Allison, uh, Shelly, Tom, I mean, without, uh, they're, they're, I think, the most unsung heroes because they're the ones making everything so easy for, for all of us, especially coming in on the weekends, any questions, anything with uh, electives, I mean, more than supportive. So I really want to make sure I give a shout out to them. Thank you. That's, that's really sweet. Thank you, Yandro. Um, all right, Otto. 
Well, um, I think friends and family. I made two friends on Leadership Foundations Week. Actually, one of them, I knew a classmate from an engineering undergrad society. So we ended up carpooling most of Leadership Foundations Week. We were on the same gap group at the end of our program. Um, having, but they were in different sections. Having someone I knew, I think made it a little easier uh, to be in school. But other than that, I thought the program was, was fairly difficult, but I didn't have much to worry about. Um, but <laughs> counterintuitively, uh, having a child in school made me realize how easy it was once I had my daughter. And it made me uh, just look at school differently and saying, I, I need to hunker down, do this. This is not the most difficult part of my day. That's going to come later. And it's made the last half of the program go by, I think, both more smoothly, but I also appreciated it more. It just, I saw the end coming and I knew things would change, but um, yeah, that was, that took me a little by surprise. Interesting how it, it, it kind of shook the perspective a little bit. Very cool. Thank you all. Um, well, my next question here is, um, who are your mentors or who's, who's a mentor of yours? And we'll start off with Caitlin. Yeah, um, I would say, so I had one before starting school. I wanted to um, pivot into marketing. That's kind of the reason why I got my MBA. And I asked my marketing director if she, I don't know, we could work on projects together. So she has been really gracious in giving me advice whenever I needed it. Um, and it's just kind of been that, um, a sense of support for me throughout this journey. And then also, since I've started school, I actually have been able to learn a lot and seek advice from a couple of my peers on FEMBA Council, which was new to me. I'd never had a mentor who was like my age. Um, but I would say that those are my two mentors now. Awesome. I guess we can keep going in the same order if you, you all feel comfortable. Uh, uh, I think that was Yandra next. Oh, I think you might be muted. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, so my mentor, uh, I mean, official mentor that I had uh, during the program and, and we stay in contact now uh, is uh, Joe Barragan. He's part of um, the Center for Global Management. Uh, they have a mentorship program uh, that goes for six months officially. And uh, it's, a, it's an application process and it's a, it's a more formal uh, mentorship program. And, and I think that's a, a relationship that I found uh, uh, just very fruitful. Like I mentioned, we, we, we've been in contact throughout. I spoke with him a couple of weeks ago. And uh, that's been, yeah, a very valuable relationship that without Anderson, I wouldn't have been able to, to meet, so. Go. Nice. Yeah, I can go next. Um, so I'm lucky to have uh, several mentors to inside and outside of Boeing uh, in various capacities. I think the one I wanna highlight for this panel though is uh, my mentor, Albert Alfaro. So he's a retired Boeing, he used to work in satellites as an executive. Um, and he actually went above and beyond what I ever expected. So as I mentioned, I was flying once a month from Seattle into the LA area for school. And um, he actually let me stay in his home the Thursday night before classes um, so that I wouldn't have to cover hotel. And so I would stay with him and his family. Uh, Friday mornings, we would have breakfast together, catch up on how things were going, maybe get a little of those pep talks that I talked about earlier. And then he dropped me off for school for Friday. <laughs> it was very, very sweet. Um, but yeah, and then he'd tackle, you know, school Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then fly home on uh, to Seattle, rather, uh, on Sunday. So it was just amazing to have that relationship back from Boeing. And then even after Boeing that he left um, and was in the area that he offered that help, um, not just from, from a room and board perspective, but then also just, again, from an emotional kind of pep talk uh, perspective. It was something that really meant a lot. Thanks, Liz. Otto, do you have anything to share? I forgot I was next. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I do not, actually. Uh, something that has driven me for a long time is that I know it's important to have mentors, but uh, no, I, I don't think I, I have had the fortune to uh, see people that I think can be mentors. Uh, I talk to my wife about this often, that she went to UC Santa Barbara and has a lot of friends younger friends that similarly don't have mentors. So we've talked about that. And she's actually trying to start some kind of program to help that. But um, yeah, no. 
Thanks. I think that's also important to note. Thank you, Otto. Not everyone can, not everyone is offered those uh, that hand. Um, so it's, it's something very, very important to note. So thank you for acknowledging that. Um, and, and so great that you were still able to go through this journey and, and have find that, um, find that energy within yourself and within people that are surrounding you. So thank you for, for acknowledging that. So in a sentence or two, can each panelist provide one last piece of advice that you have or that was shared with you um, that you'd like to share with the prospective students on the call today? Sure, I would say for me, get involved quickly and try things that scare you. I've gotten just as much, if not more, out of the extracurricular activities as I do from class. Yandra? This is Yandro. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's a little more than a sentence or two, but uh, but I think right now it's a very interesting time with um, you know with COVID and and uh, it's, and being in a program that you're going to do some stuff remotely possibly. Um, it's a very challenging time, and you can tackle things in different ways. So I think this is a great opportunity, especially for for the Latino community, since you've seen some of the statistics of of growth as well, is to figure out how you can. Um, uh, you know, go through the, the haze and, and, and uh, show the leadership style because you're going to be at UCLA, you'll have very type A personalities, everyone's super driven, and there's a, a different perspectives that you're going to uh, deal with as well. So find opportunities where you can take a, a breath and, uh, and exert that, that leadership um, experience. I think it's just a really good time right now to, um, yeah, to exercise that. Cool. I think the thing that came to mind for, for advice is be intentional. So I just want to credit everyone that's on this call right now. You're, you're already being intentional on, on looking for information on, on pursuing Anderson. Um, I'll just say carry that through as you go forward. Know your why, know why you're doing it, you know, what what you're looking to gain from the program. And, and in terms of opportunities, there's more opportunities in time. So just be sure that you know what you're looking for and make it happen in the time that you're there because it'll go by faster than you expect. Um, I have two. Professionally, I would say, or for your career, do the on-campus recruiting. Even if you don't plan to change careers or, or industries, do the recruiting. They are a great exercise in just learning how to market yourself for the, for the entirety of your career. Um, and academically, um, make sure you learn. There are some great professors here, and you can get by, I think, without learning all they have to teach you. I learned like I said before, more than I even expected to learn from, from some of the best professors I've ever had. Thank you. I want to be sure to, to answer any questions that the participants have. So if anyone has a question, there's a raise hand feature on Zoom. So you can go ahead and raise your hand and we can get to you or you could feel free to um, unmute your, well, that might get messy. You can actually feel free to, to chat it. Uh, let me know if you have a question um, and we can answer it through chat or you can use the raise hand feature. Athena has a question. All right, Athena, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello, I'm sorry I'm in the dark, but I had a long work day. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for sharing your personal story and to Gonzalo for framing all of that amazing statistics that were shared. It, it really inspired me as a Latina. I am from uh, Houston, Texas, and I used to work at the University of Miami and I work at UCLA, so I feel connected to all of you right now. So uh, this is really exciting. And I'm, I'm a Tejana, a, a sort of a native Texan with a Mexican roots myself. Um, my question is gonna be both personal, but also kind of inspirational about what I wanna do. I'm certainly interested in the executive MBA program. I'm a director of one of the libraries here at UCLA, and I'm very interested in the intersection of um, nonprofits and uh, philanthropy, mm -hmm. thinking of the third sector. And that's something I really wanna explore if I get accepted into the program, uh, certainly as I grow in my uh, expertise as a administrator in higher ed. 
Um, but my question to the four of you, if you wouldn't mind, this would really be helpful to me. As you succeed in your work and your impact is more understood to yourself, where do you see your philanthropic desires going? What, when it, what kind of areas would you like to contribute to? Or where do you think would be the most impact for your interests, as well as thinking about the whole spectrum um, from when you were all saying how you were young children and maybe lacked exposure or had a little boost like, um, like Caitlin did, or as you grow in your fields and you're seeing areas in your communities or in your interests that might inspire your money to be frank. Thank you. I can go first on that one. Um, for me, it's 100% education. Um, I just think that's, you know, I, I did some work with Minds Matter LA and I feel like um, programs like that are what's going to kind of change um, the status quo and get more people in the door. Yeah, Tina, this is uh, Yandro. Um, I think that's my favorite question I've, I've uh, ever been asked. Um, uh, so thank you for asking it. Uh, I, I've been involved with a nonprofit uh, for, for a long time now, um, especially through banking. A lot of banks um, obviously have a philanthropic uh, arm that uh, invests in the communities. And uh, so I've done financial literacy for a long time uh, through Junior Achievement. I just uh, left the board of Junior Achievement recently. And I, and I just uh, joined the, the board of directors for an organization in San Diego called San Diego Youth Services. And it's uh, focused on, on homeless youth because uh, that's a, um, obviously uh, a challenge that uh, in California we're facing quite a bit. In LA, there's the Covenant House, which is another amazing organization. So I think to answer your question, um, after the program, I've, I've really uh, been focusing on where I can uh, uh, join boards that have a passion that share the same mission as me and uh, see how I can um, make an impact in, in that way. So thanks for the question. Yeah. Athena, Athena, Athena we do have a specialization in social impact um, at Anderson. Uh, several classes focused on the nonprofit sector and community. Uh, a couple of our international programs um, are focused on the nonprofit or social entrepreneurship sector. And, um, and then for your capstone, we always have some projects that are for nonprofit organizations that you can choose to work on as a team. So there will be opportunities within the program as well. The, the global immersion to South Africa was a social entrepreneurship and it was amazing is not enough of a word. Yeah, just to add, um, I think for me, what's been there for the last couple of decades and then what continues going forward is STEM outreach. So science, technology, engineering, and math and specific for the underrepresented demographics. So spend a lot of, uh, of my time and, and financial support uh, for like K through 12 or university outreach just on trying to promote higher education in STEM. Christina, do we have room for one more question from Alexis? We do. Okay. One more. Alexis. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my question is in regards to balancing, uh, you know, activities in school. So I, I'm a business analyst slash systems analyst, lots of project work, late nights, you know, in undergrad, I was working part time. So it was very easy to be involved. I love being involved still involved as much as possible with organizations I'm a part of today. But, you know, as you get further into your career, it definitely becomes a challenge. And then adding, you know, um, graduate courses to that. How did you balance, you know, trying to stay involved with school and, you know, growing careers and families? I am probably not the best person to answer this because I don't feel like my current job is as demanding as most people's or definitely yours sounds a little bit more demanding. So maybe one of the other folks can take this one. I can answer that. So I, I, it, it's, it's a hard question to answer because um, uh, th that's a commitment that I think going into it, you have to really understand and make sure you bring your significant others or friends and everyone else has to be in line. I think maybe that's why that question was asked earlier about uh, uh, people involved and in the success why in the program, because you do spend, I mean, for two years, uh, most of my uh, friends, uh, when they ask to do certain activities, I tell them, no, I can't. I'm in school every other weekend and the weekend that I'm not there, I'm working on school stuff. So they, it's, um, 
it, it is a, a commitment but um, as busy, and I have a demanding job as well, so I was, I was working 50, 60 hours plus 30 plus hours, 20 to 30 hours of, uh, of school. Um, but ultimately, I came to the realization that there were, they were in these incredible women in the program that, that had, had um, uh, babies during the program, and they were doing it. There's attorneys, there's, there's uh, physicians in the program saving lives. So I figured if they can do it, you know, I, I can't complain too much. Um, but ultimately, it's really just balancing. You, you you, you push yourself to the limit and you realize you just, you're able to do it when you, when you have to, you just find a way and it just works out. I think the communication piece goes a long way just to double tap on what Yandro said. So whether it's with your working teams at school or again, outside of school is, you know, if you have a late work week and you need to make an adjustment to some meetings with your, with your teammates, just letting them know and found that most, most folks in the FEMBA and the EMBA programs, are demanding uh, are balancing a lot of demands and so really just knowing what's important to you staying true to that and then being flexible as you navigate your your program will be key um i think you should put a lot of thought into which section you choose um i think the tuesday thursday or, or the weekday sections i just couldn't imagine that commute time that adds up you know twice a week I did the flex, which I thought was perfect for me. Didn't have to commute as often. I think the weekend ones also help kind of balance that. Um, but the answer is you're not going to get both. You, I wanted to study after a while. I, I chose to spend less time on other things because I, I, the engagement on campus was so enriching and fulfilling. And all of the major clubs have a um, uh, usually a vice president from either FEMBA or EMBA that can, sorry about the phone, uh, that can, um, you know, and they will provide activities at friendly times on the weekends uh, and, or, or evenings. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem. All right, so, I mean, we, we do have two more sessions. I do, um, let's see, I think Car Carolina, um, oh, okay, Gonzalo got to that question. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've been trying to answer as many as possible here. Okay, good. I'm uh, sorry. We, we, we do have a lot of flexibility and um, uh, we, we can provi provide some return on investment information, but I'd like to um, uh, turn things over to Dean Unsueta, who's been waiting patiently now that he's made it to, to join us. Um, and uh, let me go back to that slide, if I may a second. Um, to our senior associate dean, I will reintroduce him. He is a professor in the uh, management and organizations area here at UCLA Anderson and does research in the area of uh, diversity uh, in the workplace and elsewhere. In fact, he's going to share some of that in a, a, a mini lecture that he's going to provide on the subject for you. Um, Dino Sueta, you may have, uh, I don't know if you were here to hear the introductions of a couple of the people here, but you have a a couple of folks that uh, are both that grew up in El Paso or Houston and uh, went to the University of Texas. So I know they wow. share with you, yeah. Well, uh, so Houston and El Paso are like diametric opposites. So I'm yes. not sure I, <laughs> we're technically in the same state, but not really. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, hi everybody. Thanks for, um, thanks for coming on this call. And I apologize for being late. I was stuck on a work call and then my Wi-Fi went down which seems like the most COVID thing I could possibly say right now, being stuck working from home. Um, so like Gonzalo uh, said, my name is Miguel Unsueta. I'm a professor of management at the Anderson School. I've been here 14 years. I joined the faculty as an assistant professor in 2006. I have a PhD from the Stanford Graduate School of Business in organizational behavior. Um, my my academic background is I'm a psychologist by training, a, a social psychologist. My undergraduate degree is from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, yeah, and so today I'm gonna, I guess I'll talk a little bit about sort of my journey here to UCLA. And then I'll also just give you a, a little bit of a taste of the kind of research that I do. Um, I think something that students oftentimes don't realize is that faculty, at least latter faculty, um, we are here essentially to be researchers and teachers. And oftentimes you only get to see us as teachers and you don't realize there's this whole other world that we're occupying where we're trying to write papers and conduct studies um, and you know, run data and whatever our academic disciplines happen to be, whether it be in my case, psychology 
or economics or finance or operations, whatever it happens to be. So I'm gonna just give you a little bit of a taste of what our work can look like, or at least what my work looks like. Um, before I get to all that though, I just wanted to share a little bit about my own background. Um, I'm a first generation college student. Uh, my family, they're all from Durango, Mexico. They went from uh, Durango to Juarez and then eventually to El Paso, Texas, where I was born. Um, so me and all my cousins are the first wave of our family that were born here in the United States. Um, I'm the second person in my family to graduate from high school, first one to graduate from college, first one to go to graduate school, first one to get a PhD, you know, all, all that stuff. So um, it, it's, been, it's been quite a journey. Um, I feel very lucky to have gotten to where I have gotten. Um, along the way, I've got, there was obviously a lot of hard work, but there was also a lot of very important people that sort of stood by me and, and did the mentoring, did the hard work to ensure that I was able to stay on, on the track um, to an academic career. Um, one of those mentors was my graduate school advisor, who's now, a pro he is a professor at Stanford. Um, he actually now has the same job I do as senior associate dean of their MBA programs. Um, and I can honestly say that without him, I would not be in the position I'm in right now. Um, so along the way, I, I have felt very lucky in that I've, I've found people that were quite supportive of me and my career. I've been able to do the kind of research that I think is important. Um, and I was lucky enough to find a place like UCLA that welcomed the kind of work that I do. Um, so I'm gonna just talk to you a little bit about all, all that um, uh, uh, next. So let me just share my screen. I realize it's getting kind of late in the day. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna call some audibles here and- uh, uh, I'll stop sharing if you need to share your yeah, screen. Yeah, I'll share mine. Go for it. So I'm, I might just skip around my talk a little bit just given how late in the day we are here. But uh, so this is work that I've been doing um, since I got here pretty much um, at UCLA. So like I said, I'm a social psychologist by training. I'm really interested in the way people think about diversity related stuff, if you'll allow me to just speak very uh, unscientifically. But I'm always curious in, in how people define things like racism, how people think of diversity. And the project I'm gonna show you here today, it's studies taken from several different papers. The overarching theme is when people look at a organization and say, yeah, this place is diverse or not diverse, what exactly are they talking about? What are they paying attention to? Um, and how are they defining diversity? So I'm looking for people's subjective understanding of diversity. And one thing I have found very reliably is that there are very predictable group-based differences based on who you're asking. Uh, so in general, members of majority groups like uh, white Americans when we're talking about race or men when we're talking about gender tend to define diversity in ways that are easier to, to sort of achieve versus when you're talking to minority group members, uh, be they racial minorities in a racial context or women in a gender context, they tend to define diversity in more complex ways. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what the underlying psychology of that is. And then I'll show you just a couple of studies that I've done and published that show that point. This is, um, this is not from my uh, research, but this is a, a, a graph from a paper published in the prominent sociology journal the American Journal of Sociology. And what the, the researchers did in, these, in this paper is they actually tracked how diversity rhetoric has changed throughout time. So this idea that diversity is a concept that companies and universities should pursue, it really comes into the public lexicon in the late 1970s following the Bakke decision, which specifically uh, forbade the use of affirmative action quotas in admissions decisions. So quotas are struck down, made illegal. And what the Supreme Court rules is that universities can pursue diversity as a state interest. So initially diversity rhetoric was meant to talk about legally protected categories like race and gender. What ends up happening throughout the 70s, 80s and into the 90s is that diversity rhetoric broadens. And what the, the lines you're looking at here, the solid black lines are management articles about diversity that are explicitly about civil rights and legally protected groups. 
the white line are diversity articles that have nothing to do with legally protected categories, but rather start defining diversity more broadly to be about things like thinking styles, where you're from in the country, what your undergraduate major is, basically a broadening of the concept. And so the argument is that diversity went from being very specific, a way of talking about these legally protected categories, which are the targets of systemic discrimination in the United States, to now diversity being much more broad. And the idea is, is that in the 1980s, diversity rhetoric was met with a lot of hostility from a conservative White House, conservative courts, and affirmative action compliance officers had to reposition what they were doing to be not so much about affirmative action compliance and racial data, for example, to rather, yeah, we're doing that. But in addition, we also care about diversity more broadly defined. And so diversity matters because it's about thinking patterns. It's about all these other things that have nothing to do with these legally protected categories. And so what you end up seeing is that the general term diversity broadens to include all of these categories that were never meant to be included in them. And so what we end up with now is a very messy, very broad conception of what diversity is. And I'll just give you um, a couple of examples. Uh, in the present day, when you talk about diversity, people use diversity rhetoric to talk about race, to talk about gender, to talk about those sort of types of inequalities. In addition, they also use it to talk about variability in profession, class, lifestyle, how you think, your personality. I've heard some people define diversity as whether you're left-handed or right-handed. And technically that is the dictionary definition of diversity, but the concept has broadened way beyond the original intent of the concept. And these are just a couple of screenshots that I have found uh, fascinating, right? At least when you think about how diversity rhetoric entered into public consciousness as a way for us to talk about racial inequality, now we're talking about whether uh, diversity should include piercings uh, as this article said, and then this, I'm just gonna throw a little shade at us. This is from a couple of years ago. Um, we were bragging about how diverse our first year MBA class because we have 156 undergraduate institutions available and no mention whatsoever of the racial composition of the class. So this is what I'm talking about when I say that diversity rhetoric has changed and broadened. It's this very messy umbrella term that people use to talk about all kinds of variability, including using it to potentially try to talk about racial inequality in the present day. So as a psychologist, what I said, what, what I was talking about earlier is I studied the way people think about these concepts. There's a long literature in psychology about motivated perceptions. And what I'm trying to do in my work is capture systematically what those motivations are. And if I can predict who defines diversity in one way versus another. And so given that diversity is this kind of broad, messy category now, what I'm arguing as a psychologist is that because there's so much ambiguity in the term, people's underlying psychological motivations might predict systemic differences in how diversity gets defined. And I will argue that corporate diversity rhetoric plays a huge role in making diversity rhetoric messy and murky and subject to motivated perception. Um, the general gist of what I'm trying to argue in my work is that there is a very reliable, so to sort of make sense of, of the difference between majority and minority groups, there's a very reliable um, difference in people's reactions towards inequality based on whether you belong to a majority or minority group in general. And I'm speaking in a very broad brush term, but this is what the data suggests. And there's always differences within groups. So I totally get that. But people who belong to minority groups tend to be motivated to want to actually shrink group-based inequality people that belong to majority groups, like white Americans when it comes to race or men when it comes to gender, are actually motivated to enhance group-based hierarchies. Given that the way we use diversity rhetoric in the present day, if you say a company isn't diverse, that means you should do something to change it. If you say it is diverse, it means it is how it should be. So given that, what I'm trying to argue is that this diversity label could be used to either potentially maintain inequality by saying we're diverse, don't do anything, or we're not diverse, you got to make some changes. And so given that, I'm predicting that there's going to be differences in the way diversity is defined, depending on who you're asking. For minorities, they might want to define diversity in ways that are complex and difficult to attain, 
because by attaining that version of diversity, you might end up actually creating some kind of systemic change that mitigates the social hierarchy in whatever context we're talking about for the majority, because they tend to be more generally motivated to maintain the status quo as is, they're gonna look for ways to define diversity easily to say that we're already there, right? So that's the general uh, gist of my work. I have a bunch of papers on this phenomenon. I'm just gonna skip to the latest paper on this. Um, this was a study where we asked people, we we're really curious at what percentage minority composition would people say that a company goes from being not diverse to diverse? And the way we did it, I'll show you what we did. Um, we end up creating um, all different versions of company composition. And for the sake of the study, we sort of limited these companies as being composed of two racial groups. I'll show you what I mean in, in the next slide. And what we're looking at is at what percentage minority representation do white Americans think a company has attained diversity versus non-white Americans? I'm gonna show you data from an African-American sample, but I have replicated this effect and it's actually in the paper looking at Latinos as, um, as subjects uh, responding to, to, these, to these terms. And so the question is, if this is the question I'm asking you, like look at this company, is it diverse? At what point do you cross the middle of the scale such that you think it's now diverse, you agree it's diverse versus not thinking it's diverse. So the prediction is that the majority should be quicker to call a company diverse because the quicker you say it's diverse, that means the less change you have to make. Minorities might withhold that diversity label until they have a higher percentage representation. This would be a tougher definition of diversity. So a thousand subjects, we recruited self-identified white and black subjects. We gave people um, one of uh, a possibility of 20 different descriptions of a company that was described as either being 0% black, 100% white, all the way to 100% black, 0% white, and every possible 5% interval permutation in between. And we're asking people, what do you think? Is this diverse or not? On that scale that I showed you on, on the previous slide. Let me just get to the... So these were, was, this is an example of what the materials look like. You're randomly assigned to one of 20 conditions. This is the 70% white, 30% black condition. You're basically given a short description of a company, and then we give them this image to represent the racial composition. This would be the 15% white, 85% black condition. Again, you're randomly assigned to one of 20, and then we're get, we get people's responses, and I'm gonna show you the data on everybody's responses. So the red line represents white Americans. The black line represents black Americans' responses to our, our question about diversity. And the important thing is, is at what point this curve crosses four on this seven point scale here on the y-axis. And so what you see is that for white Americans, they actually cross four on this scale sooner than African Americans, which means that for white Americans, they say that at 24% black, the company is diverse. African-Americans say not so fast. They only see diversity at 36.6% African-Americans. Similar patterns were found when I did this with whites and Latinos. There was about a 10 percentage point gap such that white Americans saw diversity at about 10% points sooner than Latino uh, self-identified Latinos. And the same thing happened when we did this with men versus women men saw diversity at I think like 25% female, women saw diversity at about 35% female. You need that much minority presentation in order to call a company diverse. So in a very simple way, right, we're just trying to get a sense for how much, how much of the minority uh, group do you need to call a company diverse. We're finding that members of majority groups are defining diversity in ways that are easier to achieve because they literally require fewer in order for the company to count as diverse. Um, and so getting back to the idea I posted earlier, I would argue this is an easy definition of diversity or an easier definition of diversity for white Americans, the majority group, um, a harder definition for African Americans. I didn't talk about the other studies, but these are some of the other manifestations I have of this easy versus hard definition of diversity. And again, the reason this is important is because a lot of people use diversity rhetoric euphemistically to try to talk about these very difficult issues of inequality, not only in society, but also in organizations. 
And if we are systematically defining diversity differently based on who you're talking to, we might be talking right past each other, which is deeply problematic. And it's also a huge problem if we're trying to tackle these very difficult issues of racism in the present day, and we're trying to use these unspecific terms like diversity because they don't actually get to the problem, right? They're sort of euphemisms. And if we define them differently, we just talk right past one another. Um, so yeah, that was the implications I was talking about right there. So since diversity is this sort of messy concept that I would argue um, is, well, it, it's hard to define. It sort of refers to any kind of variability in the present day. Um, I think companies that don't go out of their way to define what diversity means for them and what kind of diversity they are pursuing, if they're not willing to do that, they're basically just talking about diversity for the sake of PR. So if a company can't answer questions like, we'll know we're diverse when we hit whatever number it happens to be, whatever dimensions we care about. If you can't answer or won't answer those questions, you're probably talking about diversity for the sake of PR and there's not a genuine commitment to actually diversifying your ranks. I think also for us as individuals and organizations, I think we should be able to answer a question like diversity for us means this, right? And if we can't answer that question, then this diversity rhetoric is, rhetoric is probably not doing us any good. And instead of engaging in this sort of unspecific diversity talk, I think what, what might be a lot more fruitful is for people to actually talk about these much more difficult issues around equity and racism and sexism in organizations. And one, one very thin silver lining after the horrific killing, uh, police killing of George Floyd was that for a second there, it seemed like the entire country was, in my experience, for the first time, talking and thinking about systemic racism. And that to me, as difficult as it is to talk about such a concept and as emotional and troubling it is to talk about such a topic, that's much more productive than engaging in diversity happy talk, which can be um, a whole lot of nothing, as opposed to actually talking about issues that, that remain from this nation's very dark and very troubled history. Um, so anyway, I cut this a lot shorter than I intended, but I was doing it for the sake of making sure everybody um, survives the end of the day. I know you all worked all day and, and that's the kind of sensitivity we show for our students here at Anderson. But that's a sense of the kind of work um, I do personally. Obviously my colleagues do all sorts of other different kind of research, but this is a huge part of our lives as faculty at at Anderson. Um, we are researchers, we are trained as researchers. We are publishing uh, papers in the top journals in whatever our field happens to be. And some of us are quite good at sort of bringing in our research side into the classroom, but a lot of us aren't. And so I think it is important for students to know that this is a whole other dimension of our jobs and careers at a school like UCLA that oftentimes goes unnoticed or unseen by you all because we don't do a very good job of presenting it. So anyway, I'll stop right there. I'm happy to take any questions or answer anything else about. Um, because there were a couple of quick questions on chat, which I thought were really uh, interesting questions. Uh, first and from Otto is, does the attenuation of minority groups only appear to happen when they are not a ruling minority group? In other words, do we see a different, I mean, if, if any of the research or literature shows a different um, attitude if the, the company or organization are, is majority minority? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we, Otto, did I get that right? Yeah, I was thinking of the global immersion to South Africa, where the ruling minority was like 10% of the population. What would they consider diverse? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. Um, diversity rhetoric is a very American concept. So I'm not even sure that these questions will make a lot of sense um, in a context like Africa. It's possible it might. I mean, given that, you know, a, a American... There's, there's an Americanization of the world, right? It's just sort of what, what happens when you're, you're, um, you're you know, um, are, were the dominant country in the world. Um, so I'm not exactly sure that that would translate. Um, I'm not sure that diversity rhetoric is something that is characteristic of societies that are not the United States. This seems to be a very American concept. So it might not make sense at all. Um, I do think that diversity rhetoric is in general thought of as, or, or diversity as a concept is thought to be 
kind of a minority related phenomenon. And I have some papers on that where white Americans think that when you talk about diversity, you're really talking about minority issues and it's not really for them. So there is that, that phenomenon. What happens though, if, if for example, we end up with a company that's you know, majority US born Latinos with the diversity definition change at that point, maybe, although I've never been able to run a study where I get people to count the inclusion of more white Americans as contributing to the diversity of the company. So it does seem to be very much a way for people to think about and talk about minority representation, not white American representation in, in the racial context. And one other question from the chat, Miguel, and then I wanna turn it back over to Christina and introduce Heather, who's been very waiting very patiently. Uh, and that um, in terms of diversity, for example, he, there's a healthcare company in San Diego that has a large percentage of Hispanic employees, mm -hmm. but the leadership and management is primarily identified as white. Yeah. Would this be considered diverse or not, you know? So that's one of the studies I skipped, um, actually. So that was one of the first papers I published on this phenomenon. Um, basically what I found, one of the other hard versus easy definitions of diversity, I found that um, racial minority research subjects. Um, in that paper, I had African-Americans, Latinos, and self-identified Asian-Americans compared to white Americans. Minority respondents tended to define diversity as including both the overall percentage of minorities within a company and where in the company hierarchy those minorities were. So for them, diversity was, are we here in large percentages, relatively large percentages, and are we also managers? White Americans tended to define diversity much more by the overall percentage. So they were essentially only looking at, are these folks here versus not, not where in the company are they? So at least from my early work on, this is a paper that got published back in 2012, from that perspective, I would say that this company would probably be considered diverse to your average white respondent. But if you actually show it to a racial minority perceiver, they would say, well, it's good you have percentage, but why aren't we on the board? Why aren't we managers? Why aren't we making decisions? So that's another manifestation of hard versus easy, right? So Minorities define diversity as structure plus numbers. White Americans tend to define diversity much so about numbers independent of structure. So the answer is it would not be diverse to a minority perceiver. It would be diverse probably to a white perceiver. Thank you for that. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. And I, I really, it's an example of when you come to a top research university like UCLA, the kind of exposure you get in the classroom and the overwhelming majority of our core classes are taught by our research ladder faculty. Um, and now, Christine, I'll turn it back over to you because I know that you wanted to introduce Heather and then we may still have a couple minutes to answer some questions at the end. All right, thank you, Gonzalo, and thank you, Miguel. Now I'd like to introduce you to our closing presenter, Heather Caruso, Assistant Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Heather has been instrumental to UCLA Anderson and how we have continued to define our culture through facilitating dialogue with students and staff during conversations of systematic racism this year to being innovative and taking us through new initiatives and just overall caring about the UCLA Anderson community. Thank you, Heather, and we welcome you. Excited to see what you have to say. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Christina. Um, Gonzalo, can you share the slide that I sent? Yes, just one minute, please. Let me see if I can do this successfully. Uh -huh. um, it's funny, actually, just sitting here thinking about a, a number of things that have come up. Um, oh. One of them is when when you said that I was waiting patiently. Uh, I, I, I'm saying this because I think the working people in the room and especially working parents in the room will appreciate that patiently is a little bit hard uh, to come by when you have kids as I do at home. And I'll, half the reason I had to keep my video off during most of this was because at any point, I was going to get pulled away by one or another of my kids to go handle uh, various things. So it's um, I, I really appreciated that flexibility. And to Miguel's point, um, I appreciate being in a community where life can happen, and you can say like that's what I that's that's what I could do right now, uh, and um, and really know that that many many people have your back, and um, and that's certainly been my experience of the uh, of the community. Uh, and next slide. Um, 
I want to point out something about UCLA Anderson that I think is really, um, really impressive uh, and deeply meaningful to me. And it's something that I, I kind of, um, I, I came across as a kid because my mom actually worked for UCSB uh, the entire time she was um, uh, here. So um, she's a, a Vietnamese immigrant, didn't come here until she was an adult. My dad is a Nigerian immigrant, didn't come here until he was an adult. Um, and when they kind of settled, uh, they settled in uh, Santa Barbara and, and in particular, right in that little town, Goleta, right around where uh, UCSB is. So that's where um, I grew up. And, um, and in that town, largely white and, uh, and Hispanic, uh, I, I learned a lot about what it means to create an environment where people can have uh, different kinds of conversations about diversity. I, I'm also sort of thinking about Miguel's comment about happy talk and um, the uselessness of that. And, uh, and I really agree in part because I had no happy talk growing up, like my parents being from very, very different cultures. I mean, almost as far apart on the, the earth as you can get from one another. Like that's how far, that's where they grew up. Um, and then when they, you know, sort of came together, it wasn't because they thought, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be on the same page about everything. You know, it wasn't that like my five foot tall Vietnamese mom and my six foot tall Nigerian dad looked at each other and they're like, aha, you know, obviously we're gonna have all the same kinds of approaches to everything. Uh, and um, and instead they chose in some sense like the the tough conversations that exactly um, are what uh, I think Miguel is is pointing to. Uh, and so I grew up around that, like just blatant diversity all over the place. Like, I'm just, this is how I see this. And I think that what you think is ridiculous. And um, and the honesty of that was really jarring, honestly, to begin with, because um, it didn't seem like what I saw in like the, the children's storybooks around sort of like what a happy family uh, is like. And, you know, it, it didn't have that kind of um, um, nicely kind of manicured uh, sheen to it. It was, um, it was very, real and very authentic and um uh, and sometimes that was uh that was jarring and kind of scary uh, until i realized over time as we kept going through those um those arguments really um that we also kept getting through the arguments and that was like a profound realization to me that like that if you could create a space a family context or a neighborhood context or a school context where you can have those conversations and then keep going, getting through it, you know, and keep um, uh, sort of working through the differences of opinion, hearing each other out, making yourself heard, correcting it, you know, um, understandings when you weren't heard, um, but staying in that conversation with one another, even if it meant sometimes you had to take a break, because that happened too, sometimes you got to go, it's got to leave the room, and you got to take a break. Um, but that was incredibly important to me to see that, you know, you could commit to the relationship and you could commit to the long conversation and that it ended up being worth it so many times over because as you went through it, you really built a bond of sort of confidence and, and courage in your relationship that helped you every time you did it, you would learn, well, now we can do that. Now we can talk about that. Now we can say that. Now I can, I can question that and we will find a way uh, to get the questions answered and to, and to sort of experiment with how we're going to shape our relationship. Uh, and that that was a really important thing, just recognizing sort of the power of giving ourselves the opportunity to be pulled out of our um, our comfort zones uh, and to be given support within relationships to um, to sort of navigate that and to and get through. Um, and that was sort of the first uh, kind of very informal introduction I had to something that I, I now would formally, I mean, to Miguel's um, call. Uh, define as equity. When I think about equity, I think about people from different groups. And here in, in, in the work con context, I think specifically about protected identity groups. Um, so talking about race and gender, and um, uh, there is actually a list of protected identity groups for UCLA. So if you want to get formal, um, I think it's about making sure that people from different identity groups have equal opportunity to enjoy the privileges of whatever relationship, whatever community, whatever environment. Uh, they're in, and if they don't, that you provide supports that that get them that equal uh, opportunity. And I think the sort of the seed for that for me was really laid in growing up the the way that I did, and just recognizing that you're not always going to start out um, with the same assumptions, and you might not treat each other uh, very well instinctively because you you have assumptions that uh, uh, and habits and norms that might not be um, what the 
uh, what the other person has. Um, but that if you commit to letting someone speak up and be like, hey, no, that's that does not work. This is not okay with me. Um, and commit to finding a way to restructure the relationship or the school or the community um, to put those structures, those supports in place, then you can build relationships and build uh, communities and build schools that are incredibly robust. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to point out that equity is a really important concept in the world today. I think it's a, a, an important concept here at UCLA Anderson, which is one of the reasons I'm here. Um, if you just uh, advance the slide. Um, one of the ways in which we see this is actually in the history of UCLA itself. So it's actually, uh, it's got its uh, history as a land grant school. President Lincoln way back when um, had this really pivotal concept uh, he called, or historians have called the right to rise. This notion that everybody has the equal right to rise from wherever they are to a better standard of living. And he started to realize that one of the big impediments to that was um, access to education and that only sort of at, at that time wealthy families had access to that education. So he decided to turn over huge parcels uh, of federal land to uh, what would become universities to say, hey, look, we need to create some spaces uh, that make sure that that a high quality advanced education is available to everybody. Uh, and that's how UCLA got, um, got founded. It's one of the very uh, few um, land grant universities that has really thrived. And I think that's something to be incredibly proud of. Um, it's also something that makes me really want to celebrate when we have events like this, because it highlights that everybody here who took the time to come and, and um, explore the possibility of getting that advanced education uh, is really sort of living out part of the dream that Lincoln had and that um, uh, um, so many who have followed since then have had to say that, you know, everybody really does have the right to rise and that if we create the space and we create the opportunity and we create the climate and we create the culture um, where we can have the unhappy talk, um, but be happy that we're having the unhappy talk and that we're brave enough to do that with one another, um, then we can build relationships that are stronger in the end um, and stronger along the way. Uh, and that is the, the, the part of UCLA that I, um, I find the most inspiring and the part of UCLA that um, drew me here and that I hope to see grow and become even bigger um, in the future. And I think that, uh, that many of you in the room um, to the extent that that resonates with you are, are exactly uh, the ones that I expect to carry that out. So um, please come join us because we would love to have you. And I will let you go because I know it's late and all of us have stuff to do. <laughs> thank you so much, Dean Caruso, Dean Insueta. Thank you so much, Dean Fracius. On behalf of Christine and I, I want to thank all of you who attended. This is our very first ever um, event of this sort. And so I think this is a great way to close up Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, Christine and I will be here uh, for an additional 10 more minutes to answer any questions. But either way, please, please look at our website. Please do your research and choose a school that makes the most sense. Anderson's waiting for you to apply. So have a good night and vote, please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I will stay as well in case there's any questions. Let's all stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> but if you have to leave, guys, leave because yeah, we, no, yeah, don't, don't. We, we know you have dinner and other things waiting for you. <laughs> Gonzalo, do you mind going to the next slide for our Oh, of course. Session? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Hey, that's, that's the pre-COVID look. Yeah. Tie, <laughs> soft hair, it, it looks good on me. <laughs> Still look great, right? <laughs> I, I, I start all my presentations with this picture, and then when they see me, actually, while I'm doing that webinar, they're like, whoa, COVID really <laughs> did a number on that one. <laughs> uh, let's see, do we have any questions? I, I, don't, uh, I don't see any. Um, because we are a smaller group, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, and yes. Ask, feel yeah. Free. Miguel, I feel like it's such a COVID thing to have Wi-Fi go out right when you need to, you know, make a presentation or, or something like that. So I, I totally empathize. Yeah, I've been lucky so far, but uh, I was already running late. And then 
<laughs> right as I did it, everything went down. So, of course, that's how it is. That's how, right. how it is. I actually, Fortunately, it hasn't happened to me in class. So that, that's all that matters. I was ready for today. I went and bought a router. I was ready. <laughs> I had some internet issues earlier. <laughs> ready. <laughs> I, I think um, I think that's it. Unless Melissa, Kel, and Jacqueline are just waiting to ask a question. Otherwise, I appreciate all of all of you for for being here. This is we we put this together with with a short lead time, and I think it still turned out really well. And I I, I think not just really well, really really well. So I thank agree. you all of you. I, you. I learned a lot. Today. I had an amazing time seeing you all. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just so you know, we had. Oh yeah, go ahead, Andrew. No, no, I was just wondering if, if uh, the presentation, Miguel, I know we, we kind of went through it pretty quickly. Is that gonna be available at all or are you gonna be able to email that out? Would that be possible? Um, I, sure, I can do that. Yeah. Although, we, we yeah, I, I can also, I can also um, circulate the, uh, the papers that it was based on, if that might be interesting to folks. Sure, whatever you're comfortable with, sure. Just, yeah. just to find it, because it, it just seemed very uh, interesting. So I'd love to uh, look into it. Yeah, no, th more. thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll um, let, let me figure out what the best way to communicate that is in written form. Sure. in a follow-up email tomorrow then, or yeah. whenever you're ready, Miguel. Sure. But th thank you, Roy and Christina, for putting this together. And obviously to Otto, Viz, um, uh, and I don't know if uh, Caitlin's still here and Yandro for, for joining us, because this was great. We need to do the, this a lot more often. Yeah, Weekly. I really feel good. I, feel good I appreciate your time. We need some food to go with Gonzalo. I, I know. I know. I know. With, with this great lineup, you know, we have, you know, can you imagine the, 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 the diversity of food? Potluck. <laughs> I'll bring some Filipino dishes too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Thank good you. Night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Bye.